My name is Anamina Reeder. I'm a researcher and lecturer at the University of St. Gallen, and in this video, we're going to look into the basics of experimental research. After watching this video, you will be able to answer the following questions. What are experiments and what can they be used for? And how do I design a lab experiment? First, let's have a look at the basics of experimental research. In science, the process along which knowledge is acquired usually follows a specific schema. Normally, we will start with a real world problem or phenomenon that we observe that is unexpected and surprising. On a quest to find explanations for the phenomenon, we develop hypotheses and theories that conjecture about the relationships underlying the phenomenon. Now, in the last step, we have to check if these conjectures hold and eliminate the ones that don't. And this is exactly where experiments come into play, since their goal is to eliminate erroneous hypotheses and theories. Experiments can be viewed as a central tool in the positivist acquisition of knowledge. So what exactly does this mean? It is very important to understand that experiments do not test the phenomenon, they test the theory. So this also means that before we can set up an experiment, we need a good theory. Since theories are abstracted assumptions about real world phenomena, experiments test the propositions underlying the theory. In that sense, what we can infer from an experiment is whether the theory does a good job at providing an abstracted explanation for the phenomena. We may also say that experiments are part of a confirmatory type of research as opposed to exploratory research that is geared towards finding explanations and building theory. Of course, since experiments are artificial, they cannot mirror a natural setting in which a phenomenon occurs and the transferability of their findings to the real world is limited. Let's look at a brief example to clarify this intuition. Imagine standing at this crossing and seeing all the other people patiently waiting for the light to turn green. Then these two people in a rush ignore the light and cross the street. One by one, the people who have been waiting now start walking too, even though the light is still red. Imagine having observed this in multiple places. As a researcher, you're interested in finding out why it is that one moment everyone is waiting and the next moment everyone all of a sudden decides to ignore the red light and cross the street. You dig up literature on social theory, and you find the theories about social norms and herd behavior, which you find may be a nice fit to explain what is happening at the crossing. You decide to run an experiment in which you ask participants to get from A to B. On their way, they have to cross the street, and you instruct actors to cross when the light is red to see if the participants will follow them. In your control group, no actors are present. Now, if you find that indeed the participants in your experimental group had a significantly higher likelihood to cross the street despite the red light, you have good grounds to say that your theories about socially normative behavior are indeed holding up. Yet, since in your experiment you control for everything in the environment, like if participants were in a rush and for how long they've been waiting, the statements that you can make about the real world phenomenon that you observed in the beginning are still limited because you don't know exactly what led someone in a specific situation to act in a certain way. So when we're talking experiments, we must always have in mind that their goal is to test the theory and not to test a phenomenon or create theory. Next, we're going to look at some principles of experiments. We may define an experiment as an empirical investigation in a controlled environment in which we manipulate an independent variable before measuring its effect on a dependent variable. In the simplest form, we will use two groups, one of which will be exposed to the stimulus, while the other, or a control group, is not. In the end, we will compare the results between both groups, and any difference we can then attribute to the stimulus. The first important characteristic of experiments is randomization. By randomly assigning the participants to one of the treatment or groups, we can make sure that confounding effects are held constant and will be the same for both groups. Also, 
individual characteristics of participants and other factors that we cannot control will cancel out at the group level when participants are randomized. The second characteristic is that of manipulation. In contrast to other methods of scientific inquiry, in experiments, we actively manipulate the independent variable, which is called the treatment. Apart from the treatment, all groups in an experiment are identical. Last, in experiments, we use controlled measurements so that we can make sure the reaction options are the same for all groups. Thereby, we can make sure that differences between reactions in the groups are indeed traceable to the independent variable and not to some factor in the environment. Given the setup, controlled experiments can be used to pinpoint cause-effect relationships. Let's discuss some of the pros and cons of experiments. Of course, it is nearly impossible to generalize how experiments perform better as compared to other methods of scientific inquiry, since it is always depending on your research question and the goals of your research. But certainly, there is some advantages and disadvantages that I would like to highlight. Many of the advantages relate to the artificiality of experiments that allows for a degree of control that is hard to obtain using other methods. In experiments, we may test hypotheses from theory directly since we can minimize the influence of confounding variables and isolate individual processes. In the example of the crossing, we mentioned that we could look at the behavior of crossing the street without the influence of time pressure that may have had an unintentional effect on the results besides the hypothesized main effect. In experiments, we may also build settings that would normally be really hard to access and make behaviors observable that would otherwise be hidden. Think about the famous Milgram experiment in which researchers investigated participants' willingness to obey authority when instructed to harm a third person through electric shocks. Given the high degrees of artificiality and control, experiments are usually easily replicable. What's more, randomization allows us to control for known and unknown factors and external circumstances because it cancels them out at group level. Last, unlike for instance in field observations, we can gather detailed data, for example, about participants or latent constructs to enrich our models. Now, turning toward the disadvantages, given the artificiality of experiments, the method is not suited for studying specific properties of natural settings. We already noted that experiments will only work with a good theoretical foundation. Think about theories as a description of the structure and conditions that are needed for a particular phenomenon to occur. Then experiments must reconstruct these structures and conditions in such a way that the phenomenon will actually occur and become measurable. So if you're missing a theoretical foundation, we lack grounds for conducting an experiment. Finally, a pragmatic, but for researchers indeed a valid disadvantage, Planning and conducting experiments is effortful and time consuming, and executing them requires quite some personal. Conceptually, experiments are usually made up of different variables or attributes with hypothesized links in between them. Variables refer to concepts that can take on different values and that have been operationalized so they can be measured. An example may be a person's purchase probability from 0 to 100%. Researchers often distinguish between independent and dependent variables. The dependent variable is a variable that is manipulated by the investigator. Often it is called cause or stimulus. The dependent variable is what is left free to vary and measured after having manipulated the independent variable. We can also refer to it as the effect or outcome variable. So the basic relationship that we seek to establish in experiments is the bold one below. That between independent and dependent variable. We can also define mediators or moderators if we know that the relationship between the independent and the dependent variable is not a direct one or is additionally shaped by an R factor. Control variables are the variables that are not of primary concern in the experiment and that are held constant. Last, confounding variables are factors that influence both the independent and the dependent variable and that cause spurious association between them. 
through randomized assignments and controlled environments, we try to minimize the effect of such confounders. While some variables may be observed, like whether a person crosses the street or not, some others are hidden. Observable variables are called manifest variables. The hidden variables are called latent variables, and they have to be inferred through other variables. For example, a person's attitude cannot be observed per se, so we use other variables that taken together allow us to measure a person's attitude. Being the starting point for experimental research, let's look at what hypotheses are. Hypotheses can be defined as empirically falsifiable assumptions about reality. They presume relationships between variables or attributes. And we usually get them from theory. Essentially, there are two different ways to formulate our hypotheses. Either we can make if-then statements, for example, if star ratings are displayed, then users' trust in the platform increases. Alternatively, we can relate to levels of the variables and hypothesize the better the star rating of an individual offer, the higher user's booking intention. These hypotheses are statements about the cause-effect relationship that we seek to establish in the experiment. Now, let's take a look at the design of experiments. In general, we can distinguish two experimental designs, between subjects design and within subjects design. The differentiation is quite simple. In between subjects design, participants are distributed across experimental groups, so each participant receives only one treatment. In within subject design, however, all participants receive all treatments. While of course this has the advantage of requiring a significantly lower sample size, the different treatments may create some confounding, which we usually want to avoid. Besides design, we can also distinguish different types of experiments. The two main types are the laboratory experiment and the field experiment. It can be viewed as a continuum rather than opposites. In between, we can find lots of variants, like quasi-experiments or naturalistic experiments, but let's focus on the two main types for the moment. Lab experiments are characterized by an artificial setting, a controlled environment and conditions, deliberate manipulation of the stimulus, good replicability, but low external validity. This means that because the situation is artificial and far from reality, it is questionable how its results can be generalized to other than the specifically designed setting. Field experiments, on the other hand, are placed in the natural setting closer to reality and therefore have higher external validity. The biggest issue with field experiments is the uncontrollable threat of confounding, which dramatically lowers the internal validity, which is the trustworthiness of the established cause and effect relationship. In their ideal form, experiments are designed as full factorial experiments. This means that all possible combinations of levels for all factors or variables appear in a separate condition. The participants of each condition or group only receive this specific treatment and not a second one. So we're looking at a between subjects design here. Let's take our example from the crossing back up. We said that in our little experiment, we had a condition in which there were actors present who crossed the street in front of the participant and in our control group, there were no actors. So in this simple experiment, we have two conditions, which we need two groups for. Now, what happens if we want to add another variable? For example, we may hypothesize that the waiting time influences whether a person is going to follow the social cue of the actors crossing the street or not. Assume we manipulated waiting time too. That would leave us with a two by two factorial design, namely, the condition in which actors are present with a long waiting time, the condition with actors and a short waiting time, and the same without actors, a long, short waiting time. In the same way, we may add more factors that will, with their number of levels, add as multipliers to the number of conditions. Adding another variable with two levels, presence of children and no children, will leave us with eight conditions and so forth. 
Of course, adding factors will increase the requirements with respect to the sample size. That said, experiments present a suitable method for confirmatory research with the superpower to establish cause-effect relationships if solid theoretical foundations exist. Planning and designing them is not trivial, though. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you're interested in this topic and want to know more about it, I've linked for the readings and references in the description below. Thanks for watching.